Good afternoon again. Um, I'm Nick Gowing, and uh, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, the, the organizers for the invitation to be here because it's been a very enriching few hours so far. Let me first of all explain for those of you who may not have been here first thing this morning. Um, the idea of the, um, the paperwork is to find a way of at least making sure that we keep a logic to the direction in which we're taking the discussion over the next 60 minutes, rather than moving around in a rather scattergun way. And I think there was a feeling that it did work this morning. So that's what I'd like to do, uh, to move in that direction uh, again. So do feel free to just submit um, another bit of paper later. It would have been, it could have been a tweet, it could have been a, a blog, it could have been an email, but at the moment, we're still re relying on what we all remember as paper. Um, so let's move it forward in, the, in that spirit. Uh, let me introduce uh, those who are on the, uh, on the platform. Shika San, we've, we've uh, just he heard from. Uh, Robert Feldman, who is Managing Director of Morgan Stanley um, and Head of Economic Research uh, here in Japan. Uh, we have uh, Takashi Mitachi, who is Co-Chairman uh, Japan, in Japan of the Boston Consulting Group, uh, who's written a book um, well known to many of you, I'm sure, The Art of Strategic Insight. And that's really what we need uh, in this discussion this afternoon, strategic insight uh, of where Japan is moving, uh, certainly when it comes to globalization and the economic landscape. And finally, Nicholas Smith, who's the uh, Japan strategist for the Asia Research House CLSA Securities, who spent many years in this country. And uh, it says in your CV, you spent much of your no the noughties in um, hedge funds, so which is an attractive way to put it. Um, so those are the, the four panelists that we have up here. I'm tempted, Chika-san, just to ask you, first of all, before I go to the others, how much on your final bullet, the one, two, three, that first one about competitiveness, how much in the current economic environment, uh, as we look at rebuilding Japan, globalization, and the economy, and the real uncertainties at the moment, do you feel even that aspiration is at risk of competitiveness, given the uncertainties? Yeah, I think um, the, not only for automotive industry, but also other industry, the electric appliance, digital, IT, and so on. Still, I think uh, Japan has a lot of the, you know, the, the state of art technologies. And uh, however, unfortunately, even though we have the technologies, but uh, quite difficult, you know, that uh, the under the current, the strong yen, that we can, it's very difficult to make a, you know, that the, uh, the profit if we stick in Japan. So then utilizing technology, in order to improve the competitiveness or maintaining the competitiveness, we have to leave from Japan. That this is our dilemma. So uh, the, 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 this is the issue. So then we can keep our competitiveness in terms of the technologies, yeah? But uh, we cannot keep competitiveness of Japan. Do you feel confident about the outlook at the moment in terms of understanding the way the variables are going, the way the variables in the market, the way the variables in the globalized economy are moving at this moment? Do you feel confident? Yeah. <laughs> Was that a, a yes or a yeah? <laughs> I think you'll all read something into that, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Feldman, let, let me ask you for your assessment, if I can. Um, what I'd like to do is give each of them three or four minutes just to summarize the way they see the way the um, globalized economy is moving, and particularly Japan's position in it. And it's probably going to be a turbulent few minutes as we listen to the assessment. Robert. Thank you very much. Um, my assessment of the Japanese economy right now is it's in the process of once again attempting uh, to shift from a, a tragedy story to a rebirth story. I was just in Prague a couple weeks ago uh, and I was reminded to re read my Kafka. Uh, and uh, you can think of the Japanese economy as waking up one morning and finding itself turned into a disgusting cockroach. Um, uh, there is a character flaw. Uh, vested interests. This is the same story in the United States. It's the same story in Europe. There is a, a flaw in the way we've designed our economies that allows vested interests to have too much power and slow down, even prevent reform. We're now in the process in Japan 
beginning in the United States, maybe beginning in Europe, to make a transformation to a rebirth story. Uh, I hope the NOTA government is aggressive about this. TPP suggests it might be. But I think we need uh, to act uh, really in six areas. One is productivity growth. A lot of things to be done there. Maybe later on we can talk about uh, some specifics. Deflation. Japan will never get out of its current problems. Uh, will never solve its fiscal problems unless we exit deflation. Tax reform. Lots of things need to be done to change the incentives, particularly to increase investment in uh, both uh, capital and in education. Deregulation structural reform. Uh, whatever money the Bank of Japan prints has to go to the right places. That can only happen if we have a much more aggressive structural reform uh, policy. We need social security reforms of great, great uh, depth and difficulty. Changing the pensions and the medical systems will not be easy. Turkeys do not vote for Christmas. But uh, it would be nice if uh, older uh, people, such as myself, uh, would make a few sacrifices to help the young so that we can, conti can continue to receive our, uh, at least some uh, sort of support going forward. So social security reform. And finally, governance reform, both of the nation and of uh, corporations. I have some very specific uh, pro proposals about diet reform, and particularly uh, taking uh, the upper house representation from 242 seats down to two, which <laughs> this can be done within the current constitution, and it would transform Japan uh, immediately, uh, uh, I think amazingly, and it would also constitute an effective uh, presidential system for the country, although somewhat different from other presidential systems. So those six elements, productivity, deflation, tax reform, structural reform, social security reform, governance reform, those are the things uh, that I'm looking for, uh, for Japan to go the other way and go from cockroach back to full economy. With a bit of Kafka as well thrown in. Uh, but Robert, can I just ask you, when you look, and you have six um, issues there, that's like six sides of a Rubik's cube. How many of those sides do you think can be locked into one color? How much do you think that Rubik's cube is workable? It is, <laughs> but my point right now is for me to go out to our investors around the world and say it's time to buy Japan. I don't need all six cubes to be there and be locked in. I need to see progress in a few of those areas that will then, shall we say, metastasize or transmit to other areas. Because when these things start rolling, all of them start rolling in the same direction. That's what happened during the Koizumi period. It didn't last, unfortunately, but we don't need immediate huge reforms in all of them, but we need something in a few of them to get the ball rolling. Once that ball starts rolling, the incentives change and things uh, take on uh, a new life. And here we are with uh, the G20 leaders meeting in Cannes plus more. Um, how much is this a Japanese problem to resolve and how much is it so dependent on what's happening outside? It's very dependent on what's happening outside, but everybody has the same problem. We can't solve the energy problem unless everybody contributes. We all have the same problem. China is eager to buy Japanese technology in energy because they have the same problem. So I don't think uh, this is uh, something that's uh, unique to Japan in any respect. All the other countries, developed, less developed, have exactly the same issues. Nicholas, you'll look at the Rubik's Cube. I suppose the, uh, the 20th century was one big experiment, one big social experiment. Um, and uh, we tried all sorts of societies where pe everybody tries to help each other. Uh, and what we found was, uh, with, with communism, with, uh, with socialism, that if you tie everybody's shoes together, they all fall over together. Um, and to an extent, we've had the same kind of thing in, uh, in Japan. We've tried to have a, a society where uh, it ma maintains full employment. Uh, and the trouble is that uh, it, it all works until it doesn't. So what I would suggest is that a lot of these problems are related to the fact that, um, that weak companies have been allowed to, uh, to continue on in existence. So companies that have neither a, a history nor a future of economic returns are allowed to continue on in existence until the percentage of companies that are unprofitable and pay no tax has risen from 15% in, in the mid-50s up to 74% uh, in the last fiscal year. Uh, and the trouble is that uh, we've now, if you look at the, the breakdown of, uh, of tax payments, you can see there's been a, uh, a baton touch from, 
from income tax to her consumption tax, but the other big one, her corporate tax, that's obviously the problem. That has dropped quite hard uh, at a time when actually you can see corporate profits continuing on up. So I, what they seem to be doing is uh, allowing uh, small companies to get away with, with putting all their, what we should euphemistically call um, entertainment, uh, and uh, you know, the fancy car and just about everything else on the, uh, the, the company's bill against tax. Um, it, it seems obvious to me that one of the reasons for this is that every um, faction in just about every political party in Japan uh, gets its um, biggest donations from small companies. And that, I think, has been the problem. <clears throat> Thank you. Mutachi-san. Start challenging some of the dreams. I believe in dreams and aspirations, but if, it's the, if your dream and aspiration is too big, it will ruin you, particularly when you remember green innovation and life innovation. Yes, it's the direction Japan should go, but we know that everybody in the world are going that same direction. We know that in Silicon Valley, investors have been investing heavily in green and life for these 10 years. And it will at least take five to 10 more years for us to live upon green and life. So instead of talking about too much about those future dreams, I think we need to start where our strengths are, which is by coincidence of what shiga -san said, our competitors lie still in manufacturing, but we need to change the business model of manufacturing. But I think uh, we started out this morning that uh, the age of uncertainty is the name of the world, buzzword in all the sessions here, because of the volatility of the market, because of the speed of change of the information go through the world, because of the global nature of competitiveness, uncertainty is the name game. But Japan, particularly in the manufacturing sector, is quite good at changing itself. Let me start with the numbers. 210 divided by 34 equals 6.2. I learned it from one panelist, the, uh, Nishikawa-san, on this number. 210 years from 1800 to 2009, there were 34 big earthquakes with more than 50 mortalities in Japan, meaning that every six years we were hit by huge earthquake, but we are beaten, but we stood up, and we conquer, we improve, and then we build a new model. That's why, why Kaizen, quality control, TQM, was so ingrained into Japanese culture, and not only because Japan is so good at it, but we learned it from the United States. But Professor Deming was so unhappy that the United States couldn't take up of the, of his original idea, but it bloomed only in Japan. But as I said, Japan's manufacturing model should change, particularly enhancing its value chain to get the profit out of it. One example is going to the recycling and other service. I was shocked to hear uh, from my friend in the Fuji Xerox. The new copier machine in Fuji Xerox, 95% uh, of their uh, ingredients and sourcing are coming from recycled materials. And they can build it cheaper than purchasing everything from scratch. But in order to do that, they needed to change the design, they needed to change the manufacturing line, they needed to change the service system so that they could make recycling service as a profit model for them. I think auto industry is going there, but we were shocked to learn about how TV industry in Japan is losing so much money, and they're exporting all the manufacturing base. But I believe that TV, in essence, is going to need to change because of the digitization. If you come up with a recycling TV, clock panel display, change the small tip, and you can export into Russia and China very easily because it's digitized, but nobody has thought about recycling it or second, uh, secondary market or things like that. So if you think creatively how to bring in that copier business model, auto is one, but also to other electronics industries, the others, we can enhance our manufacturing base. And of course, my last point is not only the manufacturing, because some portion of our employment is going to be exported. Of course, we are doing, uh, trying our best to change our infrastructure, as he mentioned, to retain that. But we need some service industry productivity improvement so that we could pay the decent wages to most of the Japanese public here in Japan. 
again, for example, aging, we talked about Japan is one of the advanced nations in terms of dealing with aging. But people are thinking that Japan's social security system is bust. But if you take a serious look at it, there's a faint but clearly emerging signal. Some of the entrepreneurs are making money, even under the current stream. One company called Message in Okayama, who is uh, providing a service to the seniors' nursery home, their EBITDA is more than 20% under the current system. The biggest reason is that they hire the management from Seiyu retail store to provide the care workers, you know, the work schedules by 15 minutes, which is natural for retailers, but unforeseen in the nursery industry. Providing the detailed ma operational management of Japanese system to go to into service industry can drastically change the profitability level and by then lead to the more employment. So again, business model innovation, starting with our ability to change is the name of the game, I believe. Business model must change. Let me pick up on, on some of the points and let me use uh, Robert's, Robert's six cardinal points as a way forward, um, particularly building on what Nicholas has talked about as well, the, the, the full employment issue. How do, you, how do you square that circle of, uh, of the traditional full employment with the absolute needs of, of, of business, do you think, Nicholas? I mean, all of you, let's go through some of these issues now, um, including tax reform and deflation and deregulation and social security reform, but particularly the principles of full employment at the moment. A lot of people, when they talk about Japan, talk about this aging, um, aging society, and, and they talk about the fact that um, the population is expected to fall in Japan. Um, I look at it the other way around. I say um, Japan has perfect uh, demographics. If, uh, after all, if a growing population was so important for economic growth, why did China have a one-child policy? I look at it like I did it when I was a university student and said, when, when the pizza man comes to deliver, do you want to split it five ways or ten ways? But um, I think where, where we're coming with, uh, where I'm bringing this in is to say, well, if you're going to have a system where bad companies are taken out, what's going to happen to unemployment? And I said, well, that's why it's perfect demographics. If you've got a shrinking population, you have to worry a lot less about the, um, the unemployment in the country. Uh, the result is, is what you get is, is uh, better companies making more money, able to pay people uh, more money, and we get back into, um, get out of the, uh, the deflation trap. Robert. Thanks very much. Um, the demographic issue and the employment issue, I think, are, uh, say, temporary for the next five years. After five, six, seven more years, there is going to be a labor shortage in this country. The population is falling. The uh, working age labor force is falling much faster. That's exactly why we need huge productivity improvements. Immigration would help helps uh, various ways, and I think a lot needs to be done on immigration reform uh, to bring in uh, very talented people from other countries. The Philippine nurses are very, very good. They have to come in in larger numbers. But I don't think securing employment is going to be uh, the major issue five, ten years down the road. I think the issue is the productivity of the appointment we've got and how we uh, raise the flexibility of making sure people move from point A to point B. Um, this also brings up uh, something I learned uh, as a result of my Prague trip. I picked up a little book by um, a former president, Havel. And um, he was uh, saying in, in this book that what's really wrong with communism uh, is that people get paid for obedience rather than productivity. Uh, that rings a little bit true when you think about the uh, lifetime employment system in Japan, particularly white collar lifetime employment. Uh, so what I see here is a need for a marked improvement of labor flexibility so we can get people moving around more. My uh, crazy proposal on this is uh, not to completely scrap the idea of lifetime employment. It does contribute some things, but what do we mean by lifetime? Uh, my proposal is that we have, uh, for people under lifetime employment contracts, mandatory retirement at age 40. <laughs> and what kind of pension do they get? Uh, they can get paid off by whatever they've, uh, they've uh, acquired. But the point is for the companies to be more flexible and for the personnel to keep acquiring skills. The saddest thing I see in Japanese companies uh, is people who've got up to 55, 60, 62, who don't have the skills to go for the next job that they really need now. So my view uh, is that the uh, lifetime employment system has actually become uh, a method uh, for lowering 
the welfare of Japanese workers uh, and uh, hurting the productivity growth of the economy. So to me, uh, those labor market reforms are absolutely crucial uh, for maintaining uh, employment growth or uh, maintaining some kind of uh, full employment. Shikasan, can you envisage that happening at Nissan, uh, mandatory retirement at 40? Uh, and how will you address this mobility issue, particularly when it comes to, a sh uh, you are, are you for, foreseeing a skill shortage in five years' time? Well, let me add one other thing. You could be rehired at 42 if the company wants By to the same company. you do too. Yeah, that's possible. But after if two both years. both sides agree. After two years. Would, it could be immediate if both sides really want it. Is that workable, do you think, in Nissan? Yeah, I think uh, for, for Nissan, that, uh, this is my personal view, that uh, life employment itself is not issues. That uh, the, the more, you know, that, uh, the, uh, for, for example, I said, you know, that diversity is necessary for the Japanese organization. And uh, we are, you know, the employing the people completely regardless of the nationalities or agendas. But if, for example, some areas, you know, that uh, even though we have number of the headcount of the people, but unfortunately, not competing. So the, in, the, 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 for us, is more, you know, that the issue is that the individual people's competitiveness, especially for the competing the global, you know, the business or global, the non-Japanese people who has more expertise or experience, especially for some field like, uh, for example, marketing, communications, these areas, you know, that are quite difficult for Japanese people to show they are, you know, that the explosion. So the actually, life employment issue is one. We, we need, you know, the, some address. But another issue is how to develop the people to work in more, you know, the globally or catch up the growth of the emerging market. This is for for us is now the current issues. And um, and the issue of skills and shortage of skills in the next four to five years. Yeah, not only the skills, but uh, I don't know that uh, the, I think uh, Japan's education system itself, you know, after the graduate university, same age, everybody joins the, you know, the companies and uh, almost same speed to promote it and the same experience, same knowledge, no competition at all, completely no stimulations, you know, that uh, the lack of the diversity. And these guys put on the another organization cannot do anything. You know, so how the, this is, you know, that the, 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 for me, the education and the training in, and the development in the company, this is also important factors. Let me pick up on uh, some of the questions. I've got about 30, 30 here already, building uh, particularly on Nissan, but also some of the principles. And, and Mr. Mitachi-san, if you can just stand by one moment. Hear from Takeshi about uh, the impact of uh, both the tsunami and the recent Thai flood, uh, dis the way it's disrupt disrupted global supply chain for manufacturing companies. Companies, both Japan and foreign, optimized production costs by placing factories in different countries. Now, you're seeing the weakness of that system, both in, in components and also assembly. What's your reflection? How much are you having to recalibrate um, on that? And also the competitiveness of Japanese four wheels car, wheel cars in the overseas market, as many countries like Tata from India, a Proton from Malaysia are now beginning to compete with you. In other words, you're not getting it your own way anymore. You know, that's uh, the... <clears throat> The, I, I, I think, uh, you know, the competitiveness of Japan auto industries started uh, almost production in Japan and then gradually exporting to other countries. And after that, we start to the local production in the United States, Europe, and some of the ASEAN countries and so on, expanding the local productions. And this is, we are transferring that, that the manufacturing excellence from Japan to other countries and, uh, you know, competing with each other Japan manufacturing way and, uh, for example, plant in China competing with each other and improving total. But still remain in Japan, you know, that, uh, for example, Thailand flood, another 500, you know, the supplier is now affected. But uh, the boss of all is Japanese suppliers. They have also business in Japan. They are also producing Japan. But partially, especially for the 
um, the low cost part or more labor cost labor intensive part already transferred to production in Thailand and they are producing and we are using this part for Japan and Jap for Thailand production and also Japan production. So then actually maintaining Japan production competitiveness and expanding our excellence to globally. This is current Japanese style. What I am now trying to say is quite difficult, you know, the timing to keep this, you know, mother plant excellence. We will lose everything. In this case, we have just, you know, overseas production, but how to improve, how to enhance more from Japan. But a combination of this problem and also the, 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 the high price of the yen at the moment, again, the implications as you try and think strategically in a very fast changing environment, not least because this is, of... But this is not only for the strong yen. Huh? Actually, that it is very natural for the industry, not only automotive, but all industries. If the country becomes to be strong and the people you know, become to be rich, you know, low cost part or labor intensive part to be transferred from Japan to other country. It is natural. So the shifting, you know, this is no problem at all. I have no, no intention at all to stick everything in Japan. I have no intention. The problem is the field already, you know, that, that we should keep for the future growth or the future seeds of Japan economy, the, you know, we are now losing everything. This is problem. And the challenge from, say, Tata or Proton? Yeah, we, we also, you know, that uh, we have to compete with Tata, but uh, I don't think the compete with Tata is made in Japan. You know, we will compete with Tata in made in India. But with our technologies, our experience, our excellence, this is Japanese style of the uh, fight. Huh? All right, Takashi, Robert, and Nicholas, just comment on, on the, these important principles here, and particularly the realities of natural disasters and the impact more broadly beyond, beyond Nissan. Yes, let me pick up one point on supply chain issues. I think uh, supply chain management issue after 3.11 is like the discussion on diet. If you are going to get too lean, you are going to be stumbled when the shock hit. So it's how much fat you can take on with the issues. You know, sourcing from multiple sources, from multiple countries, manufacturing in uh, multiple locations, despite overlap and the increased inventories. This is a fault. But we are yet to understand how far should we prepare to pay the insurance fee? And can we really convince our shareholders in order to avoid the disruption, how much portion of our cost should be spent for ensuring the supply chain uh, and a business continuity program? So we are still debating, but the, the recent flood in Thailand showed at least some of the Japanese companies learned the hard lessons in 311. They duplicated their source code and design documents in many manufacturing sites. So they could relatively quickly uh, pick up. But obviously, auto, because of uh, concentrations of the parts manufacturing in um, Thailand, some of the auto manufacturers are yet to find out the, the best way. So we are learning. But again, we are learning a bit more advanced way than our competitors globally. Robert, Nicholas. Let me address the, uh, the yen dollar issue uh, and uh, the uh, movement of uh, labor and capital. Uh, Shiko-san is entirely correct uh, about uh, the uh, impact of exchange rates, et cetera, in a shifting uh, comparative advantage of different industries to different countries over time. I first came to Japan in 1970. At that point, 95% of the umbrellas sold in Japan were made in Japan. After that, they moved to Taiwan, then to Thailand, and here and there. And now, today, 95% of the umbrellas sold in Japan are made in China. What happened to the people who made umbrellas? They moved into other industries. Somehow, during that process of growth in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the people who lost a job in one industry because of changing comparative advantage found new jobs elsewhere, the system was flexible enough to absorb them, even with lifetime employment at that point. What happened in the 90s was very different. For whatever reasons, the system became very, uh, uh, what is it, um, uh, uh, inflexible. And it was not possible for the people who lost jobs in, say, towel making or shoes or whatever to move into new industries because of, in my view, 
vested interests, lack of deregulation, uh, issues like that. So to me, this uh, labor flexibility issue is absolutely the key uh, to dealing uh, with the, uh, the, some of the uh, adverse impact of the strong yen. That said, I think the yen is too strong. And I say that because we're losing too much employment too fast as a result of it. There is a tendency uh, to look at the real effective exchange rate on a 20-year basis and say, well, you know, look, last 20 years, you know, we're kind of here relative to this 20-year range, and so maybe it's not so bad after all. We've seen some very senior officials at a certain central bank that will remain nameless uh, use this in, in public. I think that's the wrong comparison. The comparison is where is Japan's competitive advantage today, the price competitiveness. And if we look at what's happening to employment, I think the end's too strong. So uh, from that point of view, uh, increasing labor flexibility, uh, increasing the attractiveness of building in Japan from a tax point of view, not a subsidy point of view, which is in the current idea, increasing the attractiveness of uh, investing in Japan, working in Japan, developing technology in Japan, that's the right way to deal with a strong currency. So let me leave it there. Nicholas. I suppose the trouble with the yen is we've tried um, manipulating the yen and had absolutely no effect whatsoever. So uh, on the, uh, was it the, the 6th of, uh, of August, they spent four and a half trillion yen. The, the yen moved 1.78 yen on the day, and by the 10th, uh, we were even stronger than before we'd started. So you've got to think about, um, rather than this yen as a cell in the spreadsheet, think about what Japan's going to do about its, uh, its own competitiveness. And you know, most of the people in this room have either done uh, judo or kendo, so you've seen on the wall the sign that says, machine, don't be emotionally involved. Japan's emotionally involved with its idea of monozukuri. And it says, you know, this is what we are. This is, as a Japanese, we make stuff. We say, well, no, if you're going to be a rich, successful nation, then more and more of you have got to be the white-collar workers. So think of something like a pharmaceutical industry. They think of, uh, of new molecules. They think what they will do to the body. They make them, and then they sell them. And then you say, well, let's take a look at the business. That making the stuff, anyone can do. Let's take that business, and we'll put it in India because anyone can do that. We'll, we'll show them how to make it, we'll, we'll give them the little chemistry set to make it, and they can make it. And then we, here in Japan, will use our, we'll use our brains. Let's all be white collar workers. Then we don't have to have the, the, uh, the problem of trying to make everything in Japan, sending it overseas, and driving the, driving the yen stronger and stronger. Here are we trying to think strategically, but when the yen has changed in value 12%, since April, which is what, uh, five months or six months ago. Uh, is the, are you relaxed that this is a rational development or is it impossible now to chart which way the currency is going to move and therefore the impact on every single company here in Japan? Robert, oh, I don't mind who. Fight over it if you want. Yeah. The issues are in the abs uh, absolute level of yen versus the speed of the change. If the speed of the change since April now, it took two years or so. Japanese corporation could have accommodated itself to it. But sheer speed, because of the volatility of the market, is really the issue. Having said that, we have to think about deflation again. If a one hamburger would cost 100 yen and equal to $1 10 years ago, if it's 80 yen to the $1, deflation meaning that appreciation of Japanese yen. If you can't stop the deflation on that manner, you can't deal with uh, Japanese uh, yen appreciation issue. So, uh, in a sense, it's a growth issues, deflation issues, but we need to find out a way in a global mechanics, particularly to uh, help fight uh, too much volatility in the speed of the changes. Sometimes it's too much for any one company. So, again, in a sense, I'm not relaxed at all. If the speed of the change is going that way, we are going to hit. Everybody in the world are going to be hit, except for those companies uh, countries who are not uh, who are not in the uh, market-based currency system. Robert, relaxed and rational or not? Um, the question here is really: Do you need to be relaxed and rational? Is that economically optimal all the time? And my answer to that is no. Eighty percent of the time, I agree with Mitachi-san. We we need stability, or low volatility in exchange rates, or low volatility in energy prices. 20% of the time, I'm making the numbers up. I don't know if it's 20 or 15 or 18 or 25, but a minority of the time, we need big volatility because we're human beings. One of the biggest advances in economic theory in the last 30 years has been behavioral economics. 
linking psychology to economic behavior. Every once in a while, you need a swift kick in the pants. So when oil went to $147 a barrel a few years ago, to me, that was great. I wouldn't want it to stay there forever, but it was really good because it encouraged thinkers around the world, technologists around the world, to say, OK, let's think again about what if this would continue? How do we develop new technology to deal with this? OK, yen's gone to 75. This is very strong. In 1995, the yen went to 80. If uh, given price differences since that time, that would be the equivalent of about 55 today. That was a swift kick in the pants for the Japanese economy. And what we saw in response to that move of the yen to 80 in 1995, I guess it was, was a sharp acceleration of the deregulation program and an acceptance uh, that a lot more a structural reform was necessary in the economy to deal with this. So volatility can be constructive, it can be destructive. Uh, at the moment, I think it's a little destructive, uh, but uh, we can't rule out that volatility does have constructive effects. So it's not the volatility, it's how we react to it. Shigasan, how, can, how relaxed and rational can you feel, given that 12% is an extraordinary change in such a short period? It's not quite the Arab awakening, but it, in terms of the momentum of change, it's very, very fast when you're trying to plan strategically. You know, as I said, that uh, already, for, for example, Japanese automotive industries production portion, or, almost 20 percent, 25 percent uh, against the global volume. So then, we are affected. Yen, uh, you know, that uh, the revenue is uh, total as a total revenue that uh, not so big. That our you know sales revenue, China. United States, Europe is much bigger than Japan sales, you know, and also Japan productions. The issue is, you know, that uh, we need the time to keeping our competitiveness under the, you know, that uh, the end become to be the strongest. We need the time. The stronger yen itself is not bad, but uh, the speed is too much. For, for example, I raise one quick the example. Nissan as I said in the speech, since 1992, that Nissan has developed the lithium battery for the, the electric vehicle and uh, started investment. And the 90,000 unit electric vehicle, Nissan has invested huge, almost more than $1 billion investment. Today, we are now producing. This battery is no competitive at all, you know, against LG chemical, Samsung lithium batteries. We are shifting our, you know, that uh, the most old factory in Yokohama, the engine plant, gasoline engine plant, into combustion engine. And we invested for the electric motor, motor for the Nissan Leaf. But this, you know, maybe we can, we can expect to, you know, can reduce the cost and can be competitive, but needs time to have the competitiveness. But just we invest, Coming this year, we have no, so that other, after that, we have to invest for the uh, motors, lithium battery in the UK, United States, you know? So that means we lose, completely lose our investment in Japan. And uh, this is the issue. So that the, maybe electric vehicle motors or lithium battery will be, must be seized for the future as Japan's growth. But we are keen now. Let me, um, Yoko Horiuchi, for example, how to welcome overseas resources like capital, human resources, to rebuild Japan. What is the real competitive edge of Japan? There's a kind of theme coming through these questions. Ju uh, Takei, should the government protect weak industry to be able to remain in the market. We see protected industries lose competitiveness in the global market. And therefore, what is the proper role of government? And uh, two questions here about the Monotsukuri. Um, Andreas Borde talking about what will be left in Japan. Will it be a Japanese company or a global company? What are the roots here? And uh, None Obara about globalization of Japanese com companies, again, about the Monosukuri. Uh, are there any examples that that spirit has become a driver of success outside of Japan? 
clear concerns here about investment in Japan and the way you're able to project outside of the new balance. Um, Nicholas, your view of the way this should be developing, or will it just develop organically, in the, given that the, there are concerns represented in these four questions? Well, it is indeed, yes, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to group them together here. Um, we, we talked a second ago about the, uh, the yen, and, and, and in a way I found that uh, almost annoying, um, in that um, people who, who work in fund management don't start complaining and say it's not fair, the, uh, the market moves too much. Um, and, you know, if you think of, uh, of business as war by other means, you know, soldiers don't say it's not fair, the enemy keeps doing this to us. He, he, he tries to deal with the But situation. do you have a sympathy with a major corporate like Nissan? No, I, I feel sympathy with him, but there's nothing whatsoever that can be done. So what he's got to do is say, well, let's have a look at the movement of the, the yen. OK, I understand the, uh, the volatility of it. I've analysed it. And given the, the way that the, the market does move, where am I going to put my uh, factories to, uh, to best deal with that? Because um, he, he can't try and assume that the, uh, the BOJ is the centre half, the football player that's going to win the, the game for him. He's got to remember that, that he's actually a grey little man that's the, the referee to all of this. Um, <clears throat> On the issue of investment and ov welcoming overseas uh, interests here and the balance between that and the monotakori. There have been a number of studies done looking at uh, foreign direct investment and, and seeing that uh, there's an extremely strong correlation globally between FDI and the tax rate. Uh, and you've got to remember that the, the tax rate here in Japan is, what, 40.69% and the global average is 22%. So um, we have the government at the moment saying, let's put up the tax rate. And, and you say, well, hey, you know, only 26% of, of companies are paying the thing anyway. It's, it's not only vastly too high, it's, uh, it's also massively inequitable. So in a way, put your, put your tax down. Um, you, you will not get uh, foreigners coming into this market until you create a market in which people can make money. You, you, foreigners look at the market and say, look at those, those poor margins made by Japanese companies, as if there's something wrong with the Japanese. And then you look back at them and, and they put their businesses in Japan. So, well, you get the same low, uh, low profits when you put your businesses in Japan. It's a market where it's very difficult for anyone to make any money because it's basically June every year before you stop working for the tax man and started working for yourself. I think the other side of that, the other side of the coin, 74% don't pay any tax is a more interesting statistic rather than 26% who do. Robert, those questions about overseas resources uh, and welcoming them and the balance to be kept. When I talk to my uh, colleagues and friends around the world, everybody wants to live in Japan, particularly in Tokyo. It's a wonderful place to live. It's clean, it's safe, it's easy to get around, it's a terrible place to do business because the taxes are too high and the regulations are too big, et cetera. So uh, I think, as, as Nick was saying, we need to just redo that balance a little bit, uh, actually a lot. Um, that said, we still have a revenue problem for the government. That can be solved, I think, more by growth uh, than, uh, which is part, you know, incented by taxes. Um, but uh, to me, the key thing in, a, in attracting resources, as Nick said, is to make Japan a place where it's easy and profitable to do business. Uh, after uh, the, uh, the uh, earthquake and tragedy, uh, one of the ideas that uh, some friends and I uh, had put out was, why don't we just have a, a special economic zone with uh, zero tax rates for companies who establish businesses in uh, the affected areas for 10, 15, 20 years? Uh, but by the way, because there is this issue with, uh, with electricity prices, et cetera, well, so we'll lower the corporate tax to zero, but we'll raise energy taxes, so we'll have a much more efficient energy sector. But if you come to Japan and do a good job with energy, there's a lot of money to be made here. So that sort of uh, uh, work with the tax system, uh, I think, could be a great uh, reason to attract people to Japan. On the uh, monozukuri issue, um, I think we are lumping a lot of things into a single word. Uh, to me, uh, the word uh, actually has, uh, call it, uh, what is it, at least five stages. One is to conceive the product. J Japanese are still great at conceiving new products. There are books of all these wild and crazy ideas. Uh, that uh, people have uh, for, for new products. Um, the next session is design. How do you design them to make them uh, uh, you know, attractive? How do you produce them efficiently? I mean, Tachisan is full of great examples of how Japanese have learned to produce goods in a, uh, you know, a take a fix thing, but learn how to produce it more efficiently. Japanese companies are great at that. How to sell them, but how to sell them efficiently. And then the last stage, how to revise what you've done, take what you've done, get feedback, 
and put it back into the, uh, into the product. Uh, old man Matsushita years ago uh, basically said uh, a problem is the, uh, uh, the seed for a new idea. A customer complaint is the seed for a new idea. So Monozakuri to me is actually a, a group of, uh, of uh, 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 talents, some of which can be done here, some of which can be done abroad. As I go abroad and look at uh, uh, different countries and their sort of, uh, you know, the incentives that give people to do things, I don't see a lot of other countries that are quite as inventive as Japan is with coming up with wild and crazy new ideas for products. So that's something I think we need to, to keep. Uh, Mitaji-san. Yes. I think in order to implement what everybody is saying that we need to talk about how to control the emotional fears of opening up Japan and actually how to deal with the hollowingness of issues. Uh, for example, if we talk about unemployment, we need to de-average the discussion. Unemployment overall is 4 to 5 percent, but at younger generation, from 15 to 24, the figure is almost double. So we need to do something to help younger generation to get the job. That will help reduce the emotional tension of this society greatly. And hollowingness. We learned after 3.11 that those small, so many small companies in Tohoku were crucial for global supply chain. We didn't even know that. The small countries are small companies who have the global leader in something. So we are now seeing some of the industry like carbon fiber and others that are emerging. Maybe some sort of less value added manufacturing assembly line is going to be outside of Japan, but core devices, ingredients, with chemicals, things like that, would surely stay in Japan. We should talk about it that to manage the emotion of overall public so that we are confident that our underlying strengths. And that question, what will be left in Japan? Will it be a Japanese company or a global company? I think uh, you know, there are you know, there are many, still there are many, 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 you know, non-competitive Japanese companies still in Japan. And sometimes, you know, that, that uh, these uh, industries, these companies still protective. You know, there are many regulations. And uh, so they actually, you know, that uh, the, the more to be competitive, you know, you know the company can have the, comp company has a competitiveness uh, you know, the, uh, doing the business in globally can be survived. But if not competitive, maybe, you know, that uh, we have to uh, wait the decision of the market. But this, you know, that uh, the macro economy is not working in Japan, unfortunately. And, uh, but another, uh, on the other hand, the, the issue is Japan has 56 million population which needs a job, you know, total job that needs you know, the population is 56 out of the 120 total populations. I think uh, now, you know, that uh, Japan has not yet found out what is the future industry which can take this, you know, the, the, the population or creating the jobs. So before making these visions, if started, you know, that uh, the killing wow, this company is non-competitive, this industry is non-competitive, we shift to the uh, overseas. What happened in the employment? So this is uh, the, my big concern. So the, actually making the clear vision, okay, automotive industry is not necessarily stay in Japan. Yes, I, I, I can do. But as I, you know, the, he said that needs some of the core technology stay in Japan, uh, we need. But uh, this is our company's decisions. But anyway, probably is now that uh, the, the, there is no vision at all to employ more than 50 million population to give the jobs. The, this is a problem. So the government have to protect even non-competitive government. You know that uh, the, uh, the scattered money to the so many the companies. This is the situation. Let me offer you two rather contrasting questions, but on the same theme from Koji Nageoka, young people's inward looking attitude. Um, how can we establish, quote, a sense of urgency to the young people of Japan today? But Giles Murray says, Japan seems to be stuck in a midlife crisis, always trying to recapture the ecstasy of its high growth youth. Surely it needs to accept a more slow growth economic future with winners and losers and give up hoping for collective thrills of 30 years ago. Surely it doesn't need rebirth 
or revival, just realism. You're all smiling, Robert. I'm not sure how old the questioner was, but I get a little bit short-tempered. Which one? The, the second the question. First one, the first Giles, one. how old are you? The first one. Yeah, the first one, yeah. Do you want to uh, tell us how old you are, Koji? 57, okay, very good. I'm about the same. Um, I get a little short-tempered with, shall we say, older people, uh, less young people, um, complaining. <laughs> Uh, about how young people are inward looking and they don't do this and they don't do that. Are you becoming a grumpy, less young person yourself? <laughs> yes, I'm getting very grumpy about this. Uh, the best uh, example of this actually came from a very young and very successful entrepreneur. Uh, he's about 30 now. He started an IT company, extremely successful firm. And at a, uh, uh, actually a uh, Globus conference a couple of months ago, he said, well, you know, I've started this firm and my grandpa called me in and said, you know, uh, I actually have these loans left over from you know, when I started the family business. And you know, it's for the family, so I really hope you can pay off the loans. And uh, by the way, you know, I'm kind of getting old, and I really would appreciate it if you take care of me when I, when I get sick. And then Grandpa says, gee, you look a little you know, down in the mouth. Why don't you have any, any you know, get up and go? <laughs> of course he doesn't. It's because we, the older people, have not done our jobs in giving the young people the, the skills the resources they need. We're taking too much for ourselves. So the best way to get young people to be outward looking and forward looking, like all of the Globus students I mean, the best way to do that is for we the old to do our job as parents and make some sacrifices from our own pension, medical, uh, uh, so-called rights, the things that we voted for ourselves years ago, uh, and give them to the young people. Then we won't have to worry about young people being inwardly. They'll have a future and they'll have hope and they will start to move. Shiga-san, does your HR department see it in that way? Do you, when you're recruiting people and interviewing people or people approaching you for, for jobs, this problem of the young, the, the next generation? Yeah, that, 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 sorry. That, that, uh, your... Young people's inward looking attitude and what we've just heard from Robert there about the, the problem of the attitude of, uh, of young people and the relationship with the less old, less young people, oh, like him. Yeah. But, mm, All right, do you want to think about that? Yeah. All right. I think uh, Japan Management Association take uh, the survey every year for new recruits. So basically, starting this year, all the new recruits are post-bubble birth, I mean Heisei Umare. You know, for the first time in 10 years, 65% of the old new recruits say that they believed 10 years later, Japan is in better position. And what shocked me is the reason behind that. Because now that Japan is going through 3.11, we, as a younger generation, is taking control to change Japan. This is the, for the first time in their survey, they are talking about I or we, rather than third party things. So I think I believe in, and aspirationally at least, the younger generation is not inward looking. But one of the issues I faced in my own country, company is that uh, they haven't gone through the fierce competitions with their, within their generation. So we actually recruited uh, 10 Chinese students directly from Beijing or Shanghai this year. Actually, it changed the behavior of Japanese recruits. How? You know, they saw that, for example, most of them have no knowledge whatsoever of Japanese, but in six months, in September, they are completely fluent in working Japanese. It shocked. And most of our students, like me, is, okay, I'm going to study English year by year. My TOEFL score, the TOEIC score will like, inches up every year, but it's totally different. Chinese young generation are much more eager to learn, be aggressive, and it actually changed the behavior of the Japanese. So I think important to some extent, not, I'm not talking about immigrants, but at least five, 10 percent of new generation, we could actually import some of the new talents from emerging country, which drastically change the behavior of the younger generation in Japan. And not rebirth or revival, just realism is one of the questions here of my uh, crazy ideas uh, is uh, to take uh, the um, uh, the uh, or the, the child allowance uh, money, uh, what is it, 2.4 trillion or so they're talking, and instead use that money uh, to fund a requirement 
that every graduate of a Japanese university spend at least one year studying abroad. Uh, that amount of money, even if uh, you send them to the absolute most expensive top foreign universities, would fund 600,000 years, uh, excuse me, six, uh, hmm? 600,000 years of foreign study. Or 600,000, yeah, something like, anyway, a lot. <laughs> okay? More than there are college students. Okay? So instead of having 60,000 uh, kids a year study abroad, we could do 10 times that easily. That would change the incentives, the competitive spirit, the networking. It would bring new ideas into Japan. It would bring Japanese ideas abroad too. So I think this rather simple reallocation of spending with a uh, called regulatory backup. You don't graduate unless you've been abroad for a long time. I think that would be a huge benefit. So we, the older generation, we pay for it, and it comes back to us because then they'll be talented enough to pay our medical costs. Perhaps a little counterintuitive here, a question from Harry Cheng. What should Japan not do as opposed to do? Sometimes focusing on the not to do may give clarity to the road ahead. Nicholas. I think uh, um, the most important um, the most important words we could be thinking about now is is the world does not owe me a living. So um, if you've got problems, it's not the boss's problem. If you don't like it, move. If you don't like the the politicians, it wasn't his job to uh, tell you what you should do, what your uh, industrial vision should be. It should be you. But we've got a couple of problems here in Japan: communications and discussion. First of all, communications, and, and it, it seems a little bit uh, unkind to, to talk about, well, I'm talking in English, so you, you know what I'm talking about, um, language. Um, the, the famous Japanese physicist, uh, Yukawa Hideki, said, when I think um, that the language of physics is, uh, is English, when I think uh, physics, I think in, in English. I'm sorry, it is the language. If you want to be able to sell things overseas, you've got to be able to, uh, to learn to speak to the people, talking with them, it's really important. The other thing is, a lovely thing about Japan is everybody gets on so well together. But that's also a, an incredible weakness of the country. So every morning when I went to, uh, to school, I walked past a sign that says, with fine disregard for the rules of the football as played in his day, William Webb Ellis here first picked up the ball and ran with it. Now, with fine disregard of such incredibly important words is argue with people. You should be just, if your boss is saying something that's stupid, tell him it's stupid. That's the difference between a simple infantryman and a special forces man, is he will turn around to his officer and he will say, where did you learn your navigation, sir? Was it in the Boy Scouts? Quickly, uh, Mitachi-san, uh, what not to do? Because I have one more question as well. Providing the large enough incentive to force everyone to go into the sexiest industry, meaning the green and life. We know that the sexiest industry is not necessarily the profitable industry. And Japan's government tend to provide too much uh, monetary incentive to force everybody to go into the same direction, which is going to be a disaster. You need to pick up three or four uh, emerging companies, maybe smaller ones, to go in there and help them. That's fine. But to force all the large Japanese corporations to go into the same direction is going to be killing. Robert, what not to do? What we've been doing till now. <laughs> okay. That is, keep allowing the, uh, the entitlement spending to go up every year. The last thing that uh, Prime Minister Noda did be bef just before he became Prime Minister was to issue an order uh, to all of the, um, uh, the uh, 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 ministries, uh, cut 10% out of your discretionary spending, then we'll have the 1.2 trillion yen that we need uh, to fund the so-called natural increase in entitlement spending. That is exactly the wrong thing to do, so don't do that anymore. Shigasan, anything not to do for this uh, new global J Japanese economy? Quickly, and one more question to ask. Maybe that uh, the just um, just not to do uh, that uh, they should not have the just three, which you know they cannot be realized, and uh, you know the, without knowing the fact, real situations just. Just dream that this is, we should know real situation in Japan now. All right, the final question from Minori Tanaka about diversification and management. It's a question we get everywhere, I guess. Um, I was in uh, the Middle East a couple of weeks ago, particularly the role of women 
uh, and using women much more effectively uh, in economic development. Could you please share a practical plan on how to increase female management on boards? Robert. This uh, comes up with the, out, uh, the uh, independent director issue uh, that uh, Takanak san raised this morning. Uh, I think a corporate governance reform that would require truly independent directors uh, would be uh, probably the easiest way to do that. Uh, partly for, uh, call it historical reasons, shall we say. Uh, the fact that women have not been in the mainstream, not allowed in the mainstream, not chosen to participate in the mainstream, reason doesn't matter. They will probably be a little bit more independent as directors uh, than uh, men, just because of the way things work. So I think uh, having that outside director requirement a little more aggressively uh, adopted and forced would be a very good way uh, to get uh, women uh, in the participation. Should it be a quota uh, like in Norway? Good question. In principle, I'm against quotas, uh, but I'd have to think about that a little bit. Nicholas? I suppose when you, um, you play sport, you have the, the problem of uh, people not turning up for practice. And th there was an idea that said, well, only the people that turn up for practice will be allowed to be on the team on the day. And the, the answer, of course, to that is, I'm sorry, we can't do that. We've got to win. We will pick the best team on the day. So don't start saying there have got to be so many women in, uh, in management. Stop trying to put some, some quotas down on it and say, let's concentrate on how we can get the, uh, the best team for management. Boy, oh boy, we're just running up against the time there. And I don't think we're going to get any debate on that. But you're very firm in your view. Final thought on this, because it, it is a critical issue which comes up in so many countries. Let me start with work-life balance, the word I hate. <laughs> when I talk with uh, the women middle manager, can you just please continue to become elevated to the director levels? Work-life balance is the word. But I believe that more important thing is predictability. For example, if you need to work long hours, if you can predict Thursday and Friday, you are going to spend, can, you can spend the time with the family. If the productivity, uh, predictability is high, Quite a few numbers of women choose to stay in the job. If the productivity is low, it's very difficult. And second thing, I learned, I was forced to take the lessons for diversity in my company. The biggest learning is that career or life options for female executives are much more diverse or full than ours. In spending some time with family for a couple of years and going for full slot, they have plenty of options. In my case, walk or die. So my option is m much more limited. So we need to learn that they have more options to consider. Now, Shiga-san, uh, the enlightenment of Nissan, because Carlos Ghosn appeared on one of our BBC World Debates talking about gender equality. Three men, three women. There are five men up here. I do apologize. Um, <laughs> but what have you learned in Nissan about the importance of this principle and how it works or not? Actually, you know, as you know, that uh, the Carlos Ghosn, our president, is really, you know, promoting diversity. Including Inside, here in Japan? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. And we have clear the objective, you know, that, that how many percent manager class should be the women's manager and so on. The problem in Japan now, you know, the, it's a really, really, really pity situation, that the organization, you know, that the, and the men who are not, cont because of the, the life employment, Men who are not contributing in the company can remain in the company. <laughs> Women is now contributing to the company how to leave. This is a problem. So they how to how to support this is a big, you know, the, the, the company's uh, management issues. Do it's you have do you have a do you have a comfortable formula in Nissan yet? As a, as a private company as far as you know, I recognize you know, that the, as a company doing best effort to make, uh, detain women's employees inside the companies. But unfortunately, for example, I lost one manager you know, that, she want to keep, that she want to keep the job, but she has uh, two babies, and uh, one, uh, you know, that, uh, in order to work eight hours in the company or more than 10 hours, needs two babysitters, and the two babysitters' salary is six million yen, completely same as her salary. <laughs> you know, so that in order to keep a job, she told, she told me, what is the motivation 
Yeah. And you're not running a babysitting business <laughs> yet. Robert, you wanted to come in quickly, and then we'll go to uh, Horisan. Two things. One, equal pay for equal work. What uh, uh, Mr. Shigar just mentioned is a clear violation of the principle of equal pay to equal work, and so we've got to do that. Uh, the second thing is if we had a freer labor market to provide child services and weren't completely handicapped by the regulatory system, which is essentially a way for the, uh, the, the authorities uh, to cover uh, their uh, sweet little fannies uh, if there's a problem. If we could open up that labor market to provide services uh, more flexibly, uh, then it wouldn't cost six million yen a year uh, to get child care. It would be a lot cheaper. So those are two, reg deregulation. Uh, and uh, equal pay for equal work. Those are two things I'd mention. Right. I didn't put this on uh, as a question right at the end to kill the discussion, but I wanted to make sure it was on the discussion before we completed our discussion by 5.20, five minutes late. Professor Ori, do you want to come and close the proceedings? Thank you all very much indeed, and thank you for the question. Thank you for the panelists. Please uh, go back to your seats. And meanwhile, we'd like to prepare the, the, the front space for Mr. Yoshida Hori. Thank you, Nick, and all the panelists. I am so I have learned a lot. I'm so happy that I have learned so much from the, all the panels that we have had. I'd like to make three, just three comments about uh, the closing remarks. One is that the challenges of holding 100% in, in English conference, I thought it was a very good challenge that we have done it. And uh, I, I call it this is a globalization from within. At the same time, this is a way to get connected to the world. And then this is a way to be able to, we have televised this by internet to the world. And at the same time, there are quite a few people have flown in from Singapore and also from uh, China just to participate on, on this uh, conference. So I thought we have done a good job in terms of doing 100% uh, in English. And I think this is the first ever con done uh, conference just by 100% in English in this kind of scale. That's the first comment I made, wanted to make. The second comment I want to make was a rebirth of Japan. We chose rebirth of Japan as a theme of this conference, and uh, most of you have heard from the high school students from Tohoku in lunchtime, and uh, most of you have been moved, and I was also moved, and I always cry whenever I hear the stories. I've been up in the north after uh, the earthquake and tsunami, and whenever I go there, I get the energy. I always feel that you know, this is my destiny to do things. And we have to change ourselves and have, we have to be awakened for the sake of those people who have died and devastated in the regions. And there are quite a few people still missing. And we have to make this as a tipping point of, of Japan. We have talked about 20 years of uh, deflation and declining population and bad government debt, but we gotta make March 11th as a tipping point. And uh, for us to be doing this in English, I think it's a very important step for us to be globalized. And we have to show to the world that we are going into TPP, and we are going to open up the market, we are going to open up Japan, and we're gonna be integrated with the rest of the world. Third thing I just wanna make comment is about the, how positive I have become after hearing all the panels. You know, um, I have heard lots of Japanese people discussing and debating in English, and I know that most of them are not native in terms of their English, and, but we, we have to practice you know, our communication and debate capability and also presentation, and we have to keep on using English. At the same time, we have to be uh, uh, positive. They're always standing up to raise questions. And I'm quite proud of the audience that we have had who had been quite participatory and who had been always uh, been coming up with questions and comments, and uh, I'm so proud of all of you are here. I'd like to ask two or three people to be making comments. One would be from Alan Patrikov, so Alan, who is a mentor of you know, mine, and uh, he has flown all the way from New York to come over to this conference, and I'd like to hear your comments about what you have felt. What you have felt about this conference, and just, just a remark. Uh, 
when Hori's son invited me to come over, I really didn't know what I was coming over to. And I have to say, I, I go to a lot of conferences, and I speak at probably more than I should. Uh, and I actually have to say, this was one of the most stimulating days I have participated in. Uh, I think the best evidence is the room is as crowded now as it was at 9 o'clock this morning. And uh, I can tell you, at American conferences, uh, at 5 o'clock, you would find half the seats empty. <laughs> and uh, so to me, that's the greatest indicator, the fact that people are involved and uh, the panelists were stimulating. Uh, I participated or sat in each one of the breakout sessions. I didn't cheat and go outside and uh, do something else. Uh, so uh, I, I would say it was extremely productive. Uh, for the most part, every session was on target, and uh, I think you had a great selection of uh, panelists, except for perhaps me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Thank you. I also like to ask Nick to be uh, making some comments. You have been on the three panels, two keynote panels as moderator and uh, one uh, panel as a panelist, could you please make some comment about Thank you for coming over from the UK to participate on this. Conference. I would simply say I've spoken enough today. <laughs> and it's for, it's for everyone else to make their own view uh, clear. Thank you very much. I hope you will come back again next year. And uh, we'll, we'll, I will do everything to be able to make you to come back here uh, to G1 Summit. We have uh, uh, one uh, Chinese uh, participant from Shanghai, Yin Chang. Are you here, Yan, Yin Chang? Yin, has, he, has she left? Yin. Okay, she might have left. What, what about Paul Bradley? Paul? Oh, there you are. Paul has come all the way from Singapore to participate on this conference. We would like to make this conference as an excuse to come to Japan. And this is a way to attract people. And then we have had uh, quite a few from uh, overseas, but we'd like to have more from uh, coming to this conference just to attend, to see, and hear uh, G1 Global. So Paul, do you have any comments? Uh, yes, first it was a privilege to be here, and I thank you for the invitation. Uh, we go back to 2004 with the New Asian leaders, I remember. And I came to Japan 21 years ago uh, with the Yusin Group, so I would never have come to Asia without a Japanese relationship, uh, being part of a Japanese company, and I could never leave Asia, so I've been here 21 years, India, China, Singapore. A lot was covered today about the challenges, uh, the earthquake, the tsunami, the economy, the political issues. Uh, many are unique to Japan, and many are now common to all of us in the modern world. Uh, I think we have to leave, though, with optimism. Uh, first of all, we need to talk about how do we help Japanese companies recover from this earthquake and tsunami, and to give hope to that generation who's been impacted that we saw today during lunchtime. And so as we've been discussing, a few of us, maybe we can create a bridge with some of the small, medium Japanese companies, link them with Singapore, and see if we can help those companies through alliances access the ASEAN market with 580 million people and create some new market opportunities. What you just said a few minutes ago, let's open up Japan. Sure. And let's take some of those smaller companies that have suffered and let's bring them to Southeast Asia and give them access to new markets and create new stories. Uh, but I think we all have an obligation to give back and help Japan now during this difficult time. And I think we should leave this conference with that objective to do something personal and through our companies to give hope and to help Japan open up and create a new future, a renaissance in the century ahead. Thank you, Paul. I'd like to ask one more gentleman to be speaking. So, Kotaro Tamura-san, he has brought two uh, uh, research uh, senior persons from Rand Corporation, and uh, you know, three of them fly, flew, uh, flew from the States to join this G1 Global Conference. The first time, very first time I heard the idea of having this kind of conference in Tokyo from Horisan, I'm very sorry, but uh, it won't happen, I, I thought. <laughs> 
because we don't have so much, uh, you know, people who can make a great presentation in English here in Japan. And uh, I'm sure it's, I, I thought it was quite difficult to attract great panelists from all over the world. But you know, you did it. This is much more than I had expected. It's just amazing. Let me do more for next year's conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm an entrepreneur, so uh, entrepreneur starts things. And I believe that you know, it's good to start small and build a community and satisfy all the people who have come and then gradually build on. So I believe what's going to happen from two years from now or 10 years from now as a G1 Global, I think this is going to be the one to be, uh, the conference to be all the people to be attending from the global arena and all the top leaders will come over for G1 Global and this is going to be the center in terms of disseminating all the ideas and wisdom. And we are facing lots of uncertainties into the world, in, in terms of the world. But I, we, I think with the collective ideas and wisdom, I think everything could be possible. With that, I'd like to first, last of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers who have come over from all around the world. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> and the sponsors like Anna and Shiseido and also Ajinomoto for providing cash as well as the drinks as well as the airfares as well. Thank you very much. And thank you all the participants for coming over. My, well, our idea is to build this as a community. So it's not just a one to thousands of people, it's more like a building within the community of the people. So we, like, we encourage you to meet people and network and we have uh, drinks to be waiting as a farewell uh, uh, reception. So we hope that you will mingle and meet people and get excited and exchange ideas and meet, make friends over this. So thank you all the participants for coming over. Thank you very much. And finally, I'd like to thank my staffs you know, who have prepared this. There was a class until 10 o'clock at night, last night. And we have done all these like, uh, changes in terms of the interior. And then the class is going to start from 7 o'clock, which is like a one hour and 20 minutes. We have a class to do. <laughs> so we have a class to do. So we have to quickly change this uh, setting and then prepare for the classes. And then there will be lots of students who will be coming over here at nighttime. So with that, I'd like to close. And thank you very much for coming. I'll see you at the farewell reception. And we're going to have some nice drinks and wine. And then I'd like to congratulate all of you for coming and also and for the coming to the very first G1 Global Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.